be here. Quite happy for that to happen. And my job today is to introduce the book again. Because we're going to be yeah. on, on multi City Church, uh, we hope to provide that that home, that environment where you can self-discover. Wonderfully, thankfully, uh, with City Church, it's been a haven of rest for a lot of millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, people that are looking for purpose, meaning, and life. When you come to City Church, uh, we want you to be greeted with a hug with a, a warm embrace, with a welcome. We're glad to see you uh, as if you were family, and you are. I just haven't had a chance to meet you. City Church, you are family, and you will find a home here. allowed to go back and uh, those are the people that are there then when the New Testament opens just to give you a sense of the of other stuff going on in world history Alexander the Great 330 BC so he's 200 years after all that stuff is happening and Julius Caesar not till uh, 60 or so BC so the southern kingdom as, as I just said was destroyed by a, a group of people called the Neo Babylonians or the New Babylonians in 586 BC and then they were conquered by the Persians uh, just about 50 years later. Did I get my math right? That looks like about 50 years. So a little bit of a, a sense of where this stuff is going on. So the Persians is that kind of, is that a green color? Is that kind of a light green color? So uh, the Persians are, uh, the today's um, Iranians are the descendants of the Persians. So our Iranians aren't actually, uh, um, they aren't actually Arab. They're a whole different ethnic group. Uh, but they are today Muslim, just like uh, the Iraqis, who are the modern version of the, of the Babylonians uh, are. And then you can see where Egypt is, and of course Judah is way over there, not far from Egypt. So they're a long way from home. And then uh, when the Persians conquered the Neo-Babylonians, and of course there were Jews in captivity there, and the Persians had a really different foreign policy. Uh, up until that time, whenever... Uh, like, like if City Church uh, conquered the next church, is there a church nearby? What's the church nearby? Pardon? We don't know their name, but let's say we conquered them. Okay, we just beat the snot out of them and conquered them. And, uh, and what we say is like, we're stronger than you, so the gods we worship are stronger than your gods. Uh, but what the person said is, um, actually we all worship the same God. And what that did politically was it took away religious conflict as a, as a source of political energy. So they said to the Jews, actually, um, we worship, we all worship the same God, we just understand him differently, and some of us have a clear understanding. Uh, and so they, did, they didn't persecute people religiously. So they had in their empire, they had the largest empire the world they had seen, and they had something like 130 different ethnic groups and different religions, but they took religion away 
as a source of political unrest. Um, so that was their foreign policy. So they were more liberal towards the Jews, and they actually allowed the Jews to go home. So that's the story of, of, of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, rebuilding the temple there in Jerusalem much later. So the book of Daniel is from this transition period between the Neo-Babylonians and the Persians. And there's just a couple, uh, like the, 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 the slide, if you can see it on the far right, that's the ruins of ancient Babylon, also there on the far left, so you get a sense of, of the scale. And there's this gorgeous gate in the middle. Uh, so they, lo they love blue, deep blue, uh, was maybe the color of the, uh, of the Persians. So, uh, now back to Daniel. The Hebrew word for prophet is navi or nabi. A prophet is one who would speak God's word. That is, in fact, the chief meaning of the word to be a spokesperson. In this case, a spokesperson for God. A secondary function is to predict the future. And we often think the job of a prophet is to predict the future. That's actually secondary or even a third level in, in the Old Testament. The major job is to speak God's word, to be the conduit of what God is thinking, what God wants to communicate, to be the one who gives it to the people. So the Hebrews did have a word for seeing the future. That was sometimes translated in English as seer, or and the Hebrew word is roch'eh. So that just means to see. So once again, that's an authentic function of a prophet, but it's not the most important one. In the Old Testament, the most important one is God's got a message he wants to communicate, and this person is the one through whom he communicates it. And we moderns, we've tried to organize how we see the Hebrew prophets in the categories. And we haven't, uh, th um, they're a little bit artificial, some of the ways we do it. So we use the language, scholars do, of pre-classical prophets. Those are Elijah, Elisha, Moses, sometimes people call Moses a prophet, and Nathan. You know, Nathan's the famous prophet who, when David sins with Bathsheba, and then Nathan tells this little story about a guy who's got 100,000 sheep or something, huge amount of sheep, and he takes the one sheep from his neighbor, and David gets uh, uh, really upset, and Nathan says, well, dude, that's you. Know, that's you. <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's, Nathan's being a prophet. He's trying to communicate something from God to, to David in a way David can understand. Now, classical prophets, so, so sometimes we call these pre-classical ones the non-writing prophets. Now, of course, Moses wrote, so he's a writing prophet, but when we say non-writing prophets, we, we mean there's not a book that's named after them, like Daniel is named after Daniel. So then there are classical or writing prophets, and we divide them into two groups, major ones, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. These are really long books. Jeremiah, if you just add up the number of words, is the longest book in the Bible. It doesn't have the most chapters, but it is the, Psalms has the most chapters. But, but if you just add up the number of words, it's the longest book in the Bible. Uh, and Isaiah also is right up there, so Isaiah has 66 chapters. Ezekiel's very long, and Daniel is actually relatively short. It's only 12 chapters. And then there are the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Now, some of these are as long as 12 chapters long. Some of them, as you know, are like they're maybe half a page, you know, in, in your Bible. And as I said, maybe the best known among the pre-classical prophets are Samuel and Nathan. They lived around 1020 to 980 B.C., and the major prophets live much later, about 950 to as late as 500, even later. So that's a long stretch. Okay, is that okay? Whew, I'm tired of just talking about that. So. <laughs> so Daniel's book is 12 chapters long, and it's often divided into two parts, two halves. And these are a little bit artificial, as we'll see once we start talking about them. But the first half... Uh, chapters 1 through 6, sometimes people say these are stories of faith under adversity or under pressure. Now what's happened is these, uh, these Jews have been taken away from their homeland. They've seen horrible conditions because they've, they've suffered through a siege. And they are brought hundreds of miles away to a brand new culture. 
And if you've ever been to a you know, brand new culture, ever maybe traveled internationally and realized you don't have any idea what in the world is going on, and you have to get, you have to get used to it. Uh, so they're in a brand new culture, and they are, and they have, they're, they're conquered peoples. And some of them are brought into, uh, are, 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 are attempted at being brought into the service of the people who've conquered them. Think about that. What would that be? What would that feel like to be, even if, you're, even if you're being treated well, you're like being turned against your own, your own folks. And so there are six stories then of how you survive under that pressure. And then there's the next six chapters, 7 through 12. I don't know, maybe they're, it's best to call them their visions. Visions of the future, visions of how to understand the world, and visions of comfort. So I'm going to go just now through each of those chapters pretty quickly. So chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, we saw his name uh, on, this, on the screen earlier. He's a Neo-Babylonian king. He destroys Jerusalem. And there's three or four people that he brings back among the Jews that he wants to elevate to make them uh, important in his, his kingdom as his uh, emissaries. And he wants to feed them rich food. And they decide, nope, they don't want to eat that rich food. That's just that's caving in too much, and they're going to eat only vegetables. And the and the people there are, are worried about them. You know, uh, my job is to make you look good before the king, and you're going to eat. You're just going to eat zucchini. You know, I mean, we got we got angel food cake here, and chocolate, and steak. You know, and so I'm worried about how you're going to look, because then that's going to be bad on me. And uh, but they say, nope, uh, trust us, and they actually look better off. Now, that seems like kind of a simple story. Like, this is about nutrition. Like, you know, don't go to McDonald's, or if you do, well, just don't, you know, or something like that. <laughs> so, um, but it, 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 is a, it is a simple story probably of just saying, wow, you need to be thoughtful. Okay, you're in a difficult situation. You, you don't want to be here. You're, you're, you're serving a conqueror. But how do, you, how do you do God's will in that situation? And how do you, how do you negotiate your, fa- your faithfulness to God, your loyalty to your people, but also to the reality of that situation? So it's a simple story. Daniel remained there until the first year of Cyrus, or Cyrus. He's the Persian who conquers the Neo-Babylonians. So that means Daniel's going to be there a long time. Second story, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And he, and he has this dream and he says to his wise men, I want you to tell me what my dream means. And the wise men say, tell us a dream. And he says, why should I do that? If you're all that, you should be able to know what my dream is. You know I mean? Why am I paying you anyway? And, uh, and so they say, wow, nobody could do that. Nobody, nobody, nobody could know your dream. And then uh, they say, one guy says, well, there's this guy Daniel from among these conquered Israelites who, c- who can do it. So Daniel says, here's your dream. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream is of a, of a statue of a man, head of gold, br- uh, chest and arms of silver, you know, uh, abdomen of, uh, of, of, uh, of iron, and then feet of clay. What does that mean? And Daniel says, okay, um, here's what it means. Um, you're, the, you're the kingdom of gold, and there's going to be kingdoms after you. One of silver, less strong. One of iron, less strong. One, and then one of, like, of, of, of uh, bronze mixed with clay at the feet. But at the days of that, fu- that last kingdom, because that's what's going to happen in our next couple hundred years, God is going to set up his own kingdom. And the kingdom of, God, of heaven uh, is a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So that's really interesting. And part of the lesson here is no earthly kingdom can actually be God's kingdom. There ain't no way. Because we human beings, we have a way of making it about ourselves. So the kingdom of God isn't an earthly kingdom. The United States isn't the kingdom of God. Soviet Union isn't the kingdom of God. Russia is going to be, I mean, it just can't be. Because we are always about, at least partially, our own thing. God's kingdom isn't an earthly kingdom. 
that's a that's a powerful point the 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 book wants to make then there's and this is maybe one of the famous stories the fiery furnace these three guys Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and uh, and they're they're awesome servants of the king so part of it here is wow you know um, be faithful in the situation in which you find yourself you can serve justice and goodness even in a difficult horrendous place but if you're alive you're a believer and you're on this earth every day you have moral decisions to make what does it mean to be a follower of God in this situation how can I be true to how can I be true to God's principles about about the dignity of other human beings about 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 uh, about truth and yet not just capitulate to the political order the political order sometimes does good by accident. And sometimes it does crazy evil. So you can't trust it, but it's not, it's not always wrong. So Nebuchadnezzar, even though he's just had that dream of the, of the, uh, of the statue, then the, like the next week it's a, he thinks he's all that. Worship me. And the three guys say, I'm not going to do that. He says, oh, I'm going to have to throw you in this furnace. 1200 degrees and they don't burn up so worship me their answer is if we are thrown in the blazing furnace the God we serve he could save us from it and he will but even if he doesn't we want you to know king we ain't going to serve you or your gods we're not going to serve your gods we'll, we'll, we'll serve you but we're, when you're about justice but we're not going to serve your gods we're not going to worship the image of gold you've set up. So this is about being remembering priorities. You can serve God even in the midst of a difficult, horrendous situation if you stand for the right principles and you're, 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 you keep your spiritual life alive, your connection to God, but don't mistake the political order for God's kingdom. And then Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of a tree that is huge and goes out over the whole earth. And the lesson there is, you king are that tree. And birds come and, and make their nests and, and in the tree, and they benefit from the tree. And the idea here is, um, society, the political order, it often does things that serve good. It's not always evil. So there is good that, that governments do that they might not even be aware of. They create order, they create stability. And so birds that aren't even from this country can, can make a nest in your tree. But then Nebuchadnezzar says, is not this great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and the glory of my majesty? And then the text says, that God looks at him and says, wow, now your heart is lifted up too high. Your heart was lifted up high, okay. But too high? That's when I'm going to have to intervene. So, like I said, the, the, this part of this is the political order, society is there, for, is there for human flourishing. And sometimes the political order does things that end up being good, maybe without even intending to. But sometimes it does stuff that isn't contributing to human good. And at that point, we need to make some sort of a, an awareness for those in power. So what happens to Nebuchadnezzar is he's, uh, his mental faculties are taken away. And he ends up walking around, crawling on all fours, and eating grass like a cow. That's pretty undignified. I don't know if you've spent much time around cows. I've spent a little bit of time around cows. I, my, my uncles were farmers north of Sacramento, and I'll just say there ain't much dignified about being a cow. I'll just tell you that right now. So that's when Nebuchadnezzar goes from being like the most powerful person on the face of the earth to crawling around like a cow. And then he says, okay, now, I, now I've seen my place. 
praise the Most High. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And those who walk in pride, he can humble them. Then there's chapter 5. And there's a, his son, this King Belshazzar, sees this uh, hand writing on a wall. And it's, the, it's these words uh, in Persian, uh, Iranian, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Your days are numbered. You've been weighed and found wanting, and your kingdom is going to be divided. And that's exactly what happens. And then there's chapter 6, which maybe is the most famous one, Daniel in the lion's den. Once again, not caving in under pressure. Yes, if you're thrown in a lion's den, maybe you will be torn to shreds. But there's things that are more important than just, than just continuing to exist. What's your character? What's your, what's your legacy? What's your, you know, what, um, what kind of a what kind of a person are you to, to uh, about what things uh, do you stand? And so God does protect them. So that's the first six chapters. Then chapter seven, um, it, it really, uh, here the text switches. It becomes more what we call apocalyptic. And apocalyptic, it, 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 it comes from the Greek word meaning to unveil. So it doesn't mean um, the end of the world. It, what it really means unveiling to make clear so this is a vision that daniel has at night and so um this is their version of of uh, breaking a mirror uh it being uh friday the 13th and walking underneath a ladder this is like a bad these are their symbols for bad 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 it's night bad things happen at night it's the sea the sea was there was their image of of chaos and the sea is is there's a m crazy storm so this is like the worst possible combination. And Daniel sees, coming out of the sea, beasts. And these beasts chew up human beings. And so what they represent is human governments, human systems. So what, what the text is about is, at creation, God gives to Adam and Eve. He says, I'm going to trust you with taking care of the earth. I'm not going to interfere. I'm trusting you to, to run things. And how have we, what have we done? We've created human systems that chew up human beings. Out of the mouths of these animals, these beasts, human body parts go flying. And so God then says, okay, I've had enough. It, it, it goes to a, a scene in heaven, and God says, uh, the, the text says, God takes away glory and honor and power that he gave to the human beings and gives it to one like a son of man. And that's why Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. It's his favorite self-designation. So what, he's, what Jesus is communicating is, I am God's agent to bring God's actual reign on earth. Then there's a, 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 a story of the ram and the goats, of a ram and a goat. And this is, chapter 8 is pretty, pretty complicated, but this is a way of saying, here's what's going to happen in the future. So here are the chapters that are prophetic, because the ram and the goat represent um, the Persians and then Alexander the Great. Um, uh, he's the goat. And then there's Daniel's prayer in chapter 9, a long prayer in which he, uh, he has, after he's thought about the destruction of Jerusalem and the desolation of Jerusalem, why did this happen? And he says, God, you know, we've done wrong. Even though I, Daniel, didn't, didn't do any wrong, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to identify with it. I didn't do the wrong that got Jerusalem destroyed, but I know myself, I'm a broken person. I, I am. Not Dan, I mean Dave. <laughs> Are you? I mean, I, I, like Paul says, I, what, that which I don't want to do, I watch myself do it. And that which I want to do, I don't do. I think most of the time I'm a pretty good guy, but there's some stuff that I wouldn't, from my life, I wouldn't want on the screen right now. Or how about you? So we, that's the way we are. We're broken without, without, that's why we need a Savior to be remade in God's image. So he says, yeah, we've done wrong. We are covered with shame, yet you're righteous. So then he says, return us to Jerusalem for your sake. And that isn't just bring us back to Jerusalem, but it's also help us become the people you want us to be. We are broken and we cannot fix ourselves. We need help from you. 
chapter 10, the third year of, the, of this king, Cyrus, Daniel has a vision of a man dressed in white, a heavenly messenger. He's resisted by the prince of the Persian kingdom. So this is about the fact that there are heavenly, there are spiritual forces that are behind human governments and human institutions. Paul says, right, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers. So there are spiritual forces in our world that we sometimes maybe don't see that are behind human forces. So it's just, once again, this is a prophecy of the struggle of kingdoms. And then Daniel 7, a, a very confusing chapter. I'll just put that up there. I mean, Daniel 11. So it's a continuation, really, of that of that prophecy of what's going to happen after the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. Uh, and then chapter 12, but sometimes, some Bibles, so they'll have like a, uh, like a title there and they'll say, uh, the end times. It might not be about the end times, but it is about apocalyptic, about unveiling about, about God's action in the future. And uh, there's a mention of the abomination of desolation, which is certainly, almost certainly, um, and there's a couple times when this happens, when conquerors came and they sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, you, that's like the worst thing you could do, symbolically. That's like the worst thing you could do to say to the Jews, we just, we just beat the heck out of you, <laughs> and I'm desecrating your, I, I'm trying to embarrass your God. But the chief point about chapter 12, I think, is, you know what, as horrible as it seems right now, the end is already decided. God is the one who's going to win. He's stronger than all the forces of evil. He has got the power to save you, not from what you think you want, or to what you think you want, but what you really need. And he's doing it right now. So no matter how horrible the situation could be right now, guess what? The God of heaven, who made the whole universe, actually knows your name and cares incredibly about you and is pulling you toward the end, which is, which is a good place. So stay faithful. So I'd say bottom line, some of the points, you know, God is overall. Yep, polit politicians think they're, the, they're all that. That's what they think all the time. But, you know, 20 years later, nobody hardly remembers them. Or 100 years, certainly. So don't get too excited about that. Be faithful in adversity. Remember that God is forgiving. You can't, you can't have done anything you, no matter what you've done, no matter what has been done to you, the God of heaven loves you and forgiveness is waiting to wash over you like, like, like a giant wave if only you'll open your heart to it. Human institutions possess delegated authority. God is the ultimate authority, but he's delegated to, he delegated to Adam and Eve and the only question is whether we're being faithful to what God has asked us to do, or whether we're going off on our own. God is patient, but, you know, he didn't wait forever. And there's a promise of a future kingdom, and God is with you. I think that's good news. Thank you, Father, for your love for us for this man, Daniel, and for his comrades that were faithful so many years ago. May a little bit of the legacy of their life in faith find a home in our hearts so that we, a little bit more than when we woke up this morning, are able to live out faith in you that radiates not just to warm ourselves, but to those around us. We pray in your name. Amen. Church, uh, we hope to provide that 
that home, that environment where you can self-discover. Wonderfully, thankfully, uh, with City Church, it's been a haven of rest for a lot of millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, people that are looking for purpose, meaning, and life. When you come to City Church, uh, we want you to be greeted with a hug, with a, a warm embrace, with a welcome. We're glad to see you uh, as if you were family, and you are. I just haven't had a chance to meet you. Church, you are family and you will find a home here.